Some of our listeners have pointed out in messages to us that our show's guests seem to have abandoned Christianity or religion after leaving the Worldwide Church of God. And they wondered if we'd ever feature someone who had abandoned the WCG, but came to embrace Jesus. And we replied that we had you covered, and today we deliver on that promise. Meet Dave, the senior executive pastor at the Life Church, a non-denominational Christian congregation in Texas. I want to talk to you today about Sabbath. The fact is, my relationship with Sabbath, uh, if, if, if it were on Facebook, it would say this relationship is complicated. Okay, I have a long, complicated relationship with Sabbath. You see, I grew up in a church that was very, very strict, even legalistic, about keeping Sabbath from Friday night sundown to Saturday night sundown. I resented Sabbath. I, 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 I dreaded its arrival every week because what it meant was you couldn't do anything fun. That, that was really the best way to understand the rules. If it's fun, you can't do it. After graduating from Ambassador University in the 1990s, Dave went on to pursue a seminary degree at Baylor University and became an ordained pastor in 2004 and even served as a Baptist missionary in Sierra Leone. I wanted to sit down with Dave and talk to him about his time in the Worldwide Church of God and how it affects the way he pastors today. And why, unlike so many of our other guests, he grew more rather than less invested in Christianity after leaving the WCG shortly after it split in 1994. From 13 Media, I'm Trisha Jenkins, and this is Worldwide, the Unchosen Church. As this series illustrates, a lot of people experienced what might be labeled as church hurt or church-based trauma during their time in the WCG. That hurt took many forms, from racism to the death of loved ones, to financial hardship, to shunning, to sexual abuse, and a lot more. And perhaps because of that hurt, a lot of people ended up turning away from organized religion from Christianity, and really even from God in the aftermath of that experience. Dave, however, did not. I joke with him that he actually doubled down on Christianity by not just continuing to attend an evangelical church, but by making it his career. So I wanted to start by asking Dave why he thought he continued to pursue Christianity after leaving the WCG when so many others did not. Part of it, he says, has to do with the fact that his mom had been raised in the WCG and had to some degree been burned by it herself. And so while she was still a member of the WCG when he was born, she was mm, not as strict as other parents about what Dave could and could not do when it came to dating or Friday night activities. I think One of the big differences between my experience and a lot of folks who grew up in the church was that my parents talked with me more about how much God loves us and cares about the details of our life and and wants the best for us. They talked more about that than they did about the rules. The rules were just, well, this is just what we do. This This is what the church teaches. This is how we behave. We keep the Sabbath. We don't get to do anything fun on on Saturdays. Um, You have to be miserable. That's being a good Sabbath keeper. Um, So their emphasis on teaching about faith was not about the rules. It was about how much God loves us. And they would let me do some school things on Saturdays uh, when I got into later high school. And so I just didn't have that that intense uh, resentment maybe that, that others did. And so when I was in college and the changes came uh, in late 1994, it, it was very freeing. And I, my issue had always been, well, I don't know if God can forgive me because I know that God is good at forgiving the things that you do accidentally, but I've done things willfully, like things that I knew were wrong 
things that I said, I will never do that thing. Um, and then I said, uh, actually, I want to do that thing. And I did them very much rebelling against what I believed was God's law, God's desire for me. So I just was like, well, I'm, I'm a lost cause now because that's unforgivable. And it was when I was a freshman in college that the Bible professor said, at, at the very end of the lecture, he said, there is no sin so great that it cannot be covered by one drop of Jesus's blood. And it, it really confronted my arrogance that my sin was bigger than God's forgiveness. And, and in that moment, I accepted that God's grace was bigger than even my willful sin. And I, I, that was the moment, I think, that I became a Christian, that, that I, I engaged with and accepted um, and embraced the grace of God, that, that God's favor for us is not based on what we do, which is what I had always grown up with. Dave says that up until that point, he hadn't really considered himself to be a full-blown Christian. And that was because he wasn't yet baptized into the Worldwide Church of God. And because baptism was such a big deal in the church, he said he just never felt like he was all in. He said that at the time, he didn't really think that you could really start a life of faith until you had made that commitment. And that commitment, as he understood it at the time, was really supposed to be the result of an intellectual journey or an acceptance of a set of laws and doctrines and rules that you could follow to earn your salvation. But that outlook started to change when Joseph Dukach and other church leaders began suggesting that Christianity was more than just about following a set of rules or intellectually embracing a set of doctrines. I think I went from seeing Christianity as as something that you think rightly about and understand correctly to then it being a lifestyle that affects how I do everything I do, how I engage in every relationship, personally, professionally, how I conduct myself when nobody's looking. So that was the first transition. And then as I participated in in Christian community, I came to see that, that we can discern God's ideal for our individual lives, that the spirit would nudge us toward deeper insight and even direction if, if we sought it out. And that was fascinating to me because that had never been a part of, of, of faith growing up. And so as I began to explore this, and I had a couple of, of mentors who would talk about like, oh, well, well God, God told me to do that. And I was like, whoa, 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 slow down. What are you talking about? Like, are you talking about like an audible voice? Cause that just, that's just crazy. And they're like, oh no, no, nothing like that. It's, and they, they talked me through how to, how to listen to God and the nudgings of the spirit. And so the more I, I did that, I was given opportunities to, to teach the Bible uh, in, at church. And that was very fulfilling. And there came a point where I just I just wanted to read the Bible all the time, and I wanted to to learn more and more and more, and I would just listen to the New Testament back and forth to work on my long commute every day, and I would listen to the whole New Testament two or three times a month, and that changed, it changed me, like I started being different, and I liked that change, I liked how I was a better person, um, and I knew that, it, that God was transforming me, and so that just became my most important pursuit in my life. Then once that was there, then there's a, a surrender, like, okay, God, whatever you want me to do, you want me to change jobs or move or whatever, I'm, I'm fine with that. And then I was teaching all these Bible studies every, every week, and I was doing everything somebody could do and not be in full-time ministry. And then I was at this event, and I felt like God wanted not just my extra time, but my best energies, my, my eight to five. And so I shared that with my pastor and I was like, I don't know what that means. He's like, oh, you're going to be a preaching pastor. No question. And we, a bunch of us in, in church have, have seen this, seen this, this calling on you. We're glad that you see it now. Now we're going to help you. 
So I wanted to push Dave a little further on this last point because a lot of the people that I know from my time in the WCG still do believe in God and Jesus, but they are just done with organized religion. By becoming a pastor, though, Dave again sort of doubled down on his investment in it. So I wanted to ask why he thought that aspect of religion or spirituality was really important. So in one sense, institutionalizing is just another way of saying organizational survival, right? So if you don't institutionalize something, it it doesn't last more than one generation. And so it's necessary, if not always good, to have institutions. More so for me is what I see in the New Testament, where Christianity and following Jesus was always lived out in a community of others. From the earliest Christian writings, besides the Gospels, in the book of Acts, it was always the community where God did amazing things. And it was the community who set apart a handful of people to go and take this good news to other cultures. In, in Acts 13, where the church at Antioch sets aside Paul and Barnabas to go take the good news to the Gentiles. And so e- even this sort of almost lone ranger, I'm going to go take this good news to somewhere else, it's still sent by a community. And it's in the community that that faith is lived out. And it's sort of uh, the best place to practice loving people is with people with whom you have this in common. This, this faith in common. And once you experience that and you, you get to practice loving, well, then you can go out and love the world. And so in the book of Acts, the early church is in community. They hold things in common. There's this, this sort of micro-communism that they have going on. They share everything. They pray together. They eat together. They learn together. And then that spills over into, oh, people are, people are throwing away their babies because it's a girl and not a boy. Let's go, let's go pick up that little girl and, and take care of her. But oh, the people are sick and dying and nobody cares. We're gonna go take care of them. That that love overflows. And, and even, even Jesus says to his disciples, okay, here's how everybody's gonna know that you're my disciples if you love one another. That that's the first step. And then then you're gonna take that love beyond this, this community. And so I guess it, it's just what I find in scripture is that faith is always lived out in a community. It's not something you do in isolation. But Dave admits that finding a community at church that works for you can be a complicated process. And that after he left the WCG, it took a while to find his home. When I first left the church, I, I went to a Bible church. And it was kind of weirded out by people raising their hands while they sang, um, but it, it was refreshing and, and, and very freeing. I was put off by the young earth creationism that seemed to be required belief. And then there was a little bit of what felt like pastor worship, like the pastor said, therefore it's law. You can't have a different opinion and you certainly can't express it. And I was like, ah, oh, heck no, I don't do that anymore. And so uh, uh, there was a guy at, that I worked with uh, who was just a couple years older, but he was way ahead of me spiritually. And, and I was telling him some of my concerns about my church. And he's like, hey, why don't you come, come visit my church? And it was a Baptist church. And it, it worked better for me. And so what I liked about Baptists was that there was almost an, an overcorrection against pastor worship. Like pastors are really not very different uh, maybe they have more education, but they're not special. And that appealed to me at the time. And also a, a significant emphasis on, on scripture. And so a church that, that wouldn't go there would be uncomfortable for me. And the congregational authority, congregational autonomy, in the sense that each congregation was not subject to the rule of any other congregation or anything outside of that congregation, and that the people had the authority and it, it trusted the priesthood of the believer, which is a core Baptist doctrine. That was very appealing to me. And so that was my, that was my tradition. And so I pastored Baptist churches for years. 
Dave now ministers at a non-denominational charismatic church, and we'll get to why he made that switch in a bit. But I wondered if during his time as a Baptist minister, if his ministry had ever been influenced by his time in the WCG. I wanted to know if that experience had made him more aware of the fact that many Christians who are looking for new churches carry around that church hurt. The hurt that comes from being burned by a minister or a doctrine or a congregation in the past. Some of the things that influence the way that I, I pastor because of growing up in the church is first of all, I, I reject any undue privilege because I'm a pastor. Because in the church we grew up in, you would never see a pastor work hard, lift a finger. They were served, they were, and, and worship is, is too strong of a word, but it was, oh, the pastor is here and oh, we have to make everything perfect for the pastor. And so I'm very leery of any church that does that. I, I became a pastor to invite people into the joy and fulfillment that I have because our relationship with God is the most important thing in my life. And sometimes there is privilege and people want to do that because out of respect and out of gratitude. And so I, I try to accept it, but I, I always have a catch that says, wait a second, is this bordering on like pastor worship where the pastor is getting special privilege rather than simply gratitude? So anytime I see pastors driving super fancy cars or having private jets, I get anxious because I'm like, oh, I remember thinking that a private jet was a perfectly reasonable thing for Herbert Armstrong to have. If you put a pastor on a pedestal, then there's a risk of equating the pastor with God. And the danger of that is when a pastor carnals out and when they, they commit a sin that says, okay, they, they can't do ministry anymore, then it's, it's far more hurtful for those they lead. And it's hurtful anyway. But, it's, but the more that pastor is venerated, the more hurtful that is. Piggybacking off of that, Dave says that the other danger of pastor worship is that pastors themselves can come to believe that they deserve the worship, that they can come to believe that they are closer to God by virtue of being a pastor, or that they can come to believe that they are less susceptible to temptation than the everyday Christian. My first day of seminary, the professor of my introduction to theology class, he said, you are coming here to this class to learn things that you will never say, you will never talk about with the people that you serve. He said, the reason you study these things is because when you go see a doctor, you want to make certain that she knows far more than she needs to, to treat this little thing on your arm. You need to know far more theology than the people need you to know. Do not think it makes you a better Christian. And, and, and that it had a significant impression on me. Dave says that because of his time in the WCG, he's also very wary of anything that resembles a caste system because it often prevents members from serving the church. And he also doesn't like any kind of top-down ordainment system. So one of the things that troubled me about growing up in the church is there was, there was almost like a caste system. At the top was Mr. Armstrong or Mr. Dukach, and then the senior church administration people, the people who taught at the, at the church's college, then there was pastors and below that associate pastors and then elders and then deacons and then everybody else. And, and the appointment to those positions was always top down and it was always identified by somebody above you. And it was very much a fixed mindset. Like you, you, you are who you are. Don't aspire for more. If, if somebody said, I think I want to be a deacon because I, they serve people in the church and I want to serve people. Well, then you say that and you're, 100% chance you're never going to be a deacon. Um, if you're a deacon, you say, well, I think I'd like to be an elder. 100% chance you're never going to be an elder. It always has to come to you. And so when I left the church and, and entered into mainstream Christianity, I was fascinated by this affirmation of anytime anybody wanted to do more for 
the church or for the expansion of the kingdom of God or for missions. So I think one of the ways that growing up in the Worldwide Church of God affected the way I pastor people is I always believe that there's no ceiling in what people can do for God, that it's a matter of, of willingness, availability. We have this saying in in evangelical Christianity that has become cliche because we believe it so strongly. And that is that God doesn't call the qualified, God qualifies the called. And so if, if God wants you to do something, the desire itself is evidence that God wants you to do it and that then God will give you the ability to do it. And so definitely never telling anybody, no, you, because of who you are, you can't do something for God. That is a big, a big thing that informs the way I pastor. And as to the point on how Dave approaches pastoring new members or even old ones, knowing firsthand how churches have and continue to hurt members, he had this to say. To the question of how do you, how do you serve people who've been through this kind of trauma, anybody with significant pastoring experiences knows that most people have church hurt, not just because they were in uh, a cult or, or a high demand group, but most people have been hurt in church because churches are full of people who are imperfect. And so they've been told they're not good enough, they've been told they're not qualified to do that, or they've been squashed or been told, oh, because you're a woman, you can't do this or that. Every, everybody has, um, has those issues. And so this is also a cliche, and it's a cliche because it's true, because it is so helpful. And that is that everybody is wounded. And so you treat everyone as wounded with special care and with a special listening. Um, because everybody has has some trauma, if not in their church life, their family life, their work life. And so to, to communicate enough care and compassion that eventually people will share that with you and then you can offer compassion and more, more often compassion, less often some sort of insight. So what are the main differences that Dave now sees between the Worldwide Church of God and the churches that he's been a part of for the last 20 years? When I try to distill for people the difference, I, I say the church I grew up in believed that the new covenant will begin at the end will begin when Jesus returns. Whereas Christianity believes that the new covenant began at the resurrection of Jesus. And so that, that, that changes everything. So, so all of the things about the new covenant in the, in the New Testament, the church said, oh, well, that, that all will be true when Jesus returns. And so it was, it was quite exciting to enter into Christianity and say, oh, no, all of this ha has begun at the resurrection of Jesus. And therefore, all the Old Testament laws, while fine and good for the people of Israel who lived from, you know, the 14th century BC to now even, and who lived in that specific place, that works great. But, it, but the New Testament is, is really quite clear that those, those requirements are not required of the Gentiles who come to encounter the gospel. Finally, Dave says that his views on women and their role in the church are one of the core shifts that he's made since his WCG days. Dave freely admits that the Worldwide Church of God embraced some pretty patriarchal views, and that he, like a lot of the men who grew up in the organization, fell victim to those narratives. And he's thankful that in his departure from the WCG, his study of scripture and his connection to charismatic organizations have helped him adopt what many would term a more progressive view on women in the church. One of the, the biggest transformations in me probably was my view on women in ministry. So when we grew up in the church, a woman could be a, a deaconess, because that's how the church read 1 Timothy 3, but not an elder and not a pastor. And so a woman might be able to sing from the pulpit, but never to speak. And so that was just, that was just dogma to me. And then when I left the church and went into Baptist church, 
there was a woman in my church that I really looked up to. She was maybe 20 years older. She was very mature, very kind. And even as my faith was, was growing rapidly, I saw her as way ahead of me. And so when I began my pastoral internship, she went to the pastor and said, I, I also want to do a pastoral internship. And I, that just seemed like the most natural thing in the world to me. She was so, so much farther ahead of me in faith. And as a part of the pastoral internship, you lead a communion and, and preach a sermon, which is part of it. And I didn't know why I was okay with that. I just was. And it was while I was in seminary that I met women who were far more intelligent than I was, far more talented, um, far more gifted as preachers than I was. And I was, I was just fascinated by them. And I was like, how can I, how can I help them? I, I hired one to be my associate pastor. She later became a senior pastor. Um, has had a wonderful ministry, just retired. Today, Dave says that one of the reasons that he's now more comfortable in a charismatic church as opposed to the Baptist tradition is that charismatic churches, he thinks, find it easier to affirm women in ministry and that their views on women's roles in the church match more closely with what he sees in the Bible. That's what I see in scripture, women being the first evangelists to say that Jesus has been resurrected, women leading in the church, not, not only in Jesus's ministry, but also in the subsequent expansion of the church across the Roman world. And so the, the, the journey that I, I went on from that woman who was a, a mentor of mine in my church to the women that I met in seminary who were so incredibly talented. And, and the way that, that scripture was taught to me differently when I was in seminary from a, I hesitate to call it a feminist perspective because feminist is like the new F word in Christianity, but, but it really was. It was that what men and women are equal, equal in creation, equal in gifting and calling, equal in, in everything. I, I'm certainly not as good a feminist as I want to be but I am only as far along as I am because of my deep study of scripture. So what exactly were the specific scriptures or stories in the Bible that Dave points to as key to his transformation or that might help to convince others that women should have a stronger role in ministry? In Luke 14 and Luke 15, Jesus tells three stories to, to tell us something about the heart of God. And there's a story of a lost sheep. There's a hundred sheep and one gets lost and the shepherd goes after the one sheep and, and God is like the shepherd. And then in Luke 15, there's a story of the lost son, a prodigal son who says, give me my inheritance. And he runs to the far country. And then when he returns back, the father welcomes him back. And that father shows us the heart of God that is always pursuing us, always ready to welcome us back. The other story is the story of a lost coin, a woman who has 10 coins and she loses one. And she sweeps the whole house to find the one coin. Well, who's in the place of God there? The woman. And if we're not looking for it, we miss where Jesus takes the opportunity to represent God in a story as a woman. The, the other thing we see is just how, how prominent women were in Jesus's ministry, how they were some of his very good friends, uh, not least Mary and Martha and uh, Joanna and, and Salome. And they, they were, while they culturally, they couldn't travel with Jesus the way the men could, because that would have been scandalous. Jesus was always pushing the envelope on, on the role of women in his movement. And then when we get into the early church, so Luke writes the gospel of Luke and the book of Acts, and he always puts men and women together, not women above men, just men and women together. Very early on, you have Zechariah and Elizabeth. Then you have uh, Anna and Simeon, who are sort of these two witnesses to, to Jesus's bursting onto the scene. Then in Acts, you have Priscilla and Aquila being teachers of, of preachers and, and doing correction of preachers. Now, also negative examples, Ananias and Sapphira, who sin against the spirit. And so when you look for it, you see this equality of women throughout the Luke Acts uh, narrative. Finally, I asked Dave if there was sort of a take home message that he wanted to share with listeners that would kind of summarize his life of faith 
in both the Worldwide Church of God and in the Baptist Church, and now in a charismatic organization. I think it, it's important to note that different people had very different experiences in the church. I am deeply saddened by the trauma that so many, so many of my peers went through. And I, I have a little bit of survivor's guilt that, that my experience was not so negative and that coming out of the church, I, I came out of the church with a deep desire to serve a God who I always saw as loving. And so I have no judgment at all for anyone who, who turned away from faith, who turned away from, from organized religion, but still do faith. I'm like, yeah, I, I, can, I can see why you would reach that conclusion. I remember a friend was saying, when I left the church and I, and I gave up on, on faith completely, I just had this freedom from guilt that was always so debilitating. And I was like, me too. I have this freedom from guilt that was so debilitating. But that's because I know a God who longs to forgive that and, and, and doesn't want us to live in that kind of debilitating guilt feelings. And of course, the, my desire is that people could experience the joy and freedom that I experience as, as a Christian. Next up on Worldwide, the Unchosen Church. The worst part of it was the death threats. Oh my, I, it would be a nice normal day. My phone in my office would ring. It would be a call from some state institution, like one I recall vividly was Texas, and they were telling me that it's their duty to inform me that they have a person on 72-hour hold because he has a rifle and he wanted to come out and shoot me. Join us next week as we drop our last two episodes in an exciting double feature. We'll start by going behind the scenes of The Changes with none other than Joseph Dekoch Jr., the third and last Pastor General of the Worldwide Church of God and the recently retired President of Grace Communion International. You can listen to this episode on Apple Podcasts or wherever podcasts are made available. Worldwide, The Unchosen Church is written, produced, and hosted by me, Trisha Jenkins. Music in this episode was licensed by Soundstripe. Sound design and editing was done by 13 Media. If you would like to send us a question or a comment, please reach out via email at worldwidepod11 at gmail.com or DM us on social media. You can also find us, as always, on Instagram at WorldwidePod and Twitter and Facebook at WorldwidePod11. Until we meet again, we hope that your hearts will be as full this week as your stomachs were 30 minutes after the Day of Atonement ended. Worldwide, the Unchosen Church is also proud to support the hashtag I Got Out movement, which empowers survivors of cults and other high demand groups to share their stories online as a catalyst for education, prevention, and healing. Learn how you can share your story and support other survivors at igotout.org.